It's that time of year for warm beverages and roaring fires as the weather cools down and we settle into another three months of a Pacific Northwest winter. Coming up, our King 5 First Alert weather team covers my favorite season with your long range forecast and how you can prepare weather wise this winter. I'm your host, Chief Meteorologist Mike Everett. We also look back at some of the biggest winter storms the Pacific Northwest has ever faced, what an El Nino is and what you need to do to prepare weather wise for it. Let's jump right in. Now this winter we're expecting an El Nino and everybody's heard of an El Nino, but do you really know what one is? We hit the streets of Alki Beach to see if people really know what an El Nino is. So do you know what El Nino is? I do not know what El Nino is. Okay. What's an El Nino? Maybe nice weather, huh? This year could be another super El Nino, meaning that it goes above 2.0 in temperature Celsius or no, Fahrenheit, I don't know. Probably the atmospheric conditions or who knows? They're not really sure whether it's going to happen uh, the same way as other past super El Ninos because of the heat that's happening over in the Atlantic Ocean. It's got stuff to do with wind and water temperatures and all of that. In Colorado, the last El Nino dropped a whole bunch of snow. <laughs> You're just a, a statistic machine. Well, yeah. strike what I said earlier. <laughs> Maybe nice weather, huh? In a nutshell, El Nino means that ocean water in our part of the Pacific is going to be warmer than normal. So statistically speaking, that could affect climate patterns. That means that in Washington state, there's a greater chance for warmer than normal temperatures. This year, NOAA is also predicting a drier winter. We tend to get El Ninos every two to seven years, and it's been a while since Washington has experienced one. Meteorologist Adam Claibon takes a deeper dive on how El Nino will affect our climate patterns this winter. All right, everyone, it's time to talk about this upcoming winter season's forecast. And the last few years, it's been mainly a talk about La Nina, and this year, it's going to be about El Nino. You see these oranges and yellows here across the central Pacific. That's where those bodies of water are currently warmer than normal and also warmer than normal by 0.5 degrees Celsius and higher, which puts us into El Nino stages. And at the same time, those impacts where we typically do see an El Nino year are warmer than normal and drier than normal conditions for our winters here in the Pacific Northwest. Now, I just mentioned La Nina and a quick recap on that shows a higher amplification to the jet stream, which we kind of saw a lot of here these past few years, allowing that colder air and that snow to develop across parts of the Pacific Northwest. With the El Nino, well, we see less of an amplification to that jet stream, more of a zonal flow from west to east in the subtropical jet stream. Well, that starts to get ramped up and a lot more of that moisture stays across the southern part of the country as opposed to it being transported up this way across the Pacific Northwest. Now with more of that zonal flow, more of our air masses come off of the ocean, which typically will be warmer than what we would see coming out of the north here from Canada. So a quick recap on this current El Nino. It's at moderate stages expected to get up towards a strong El Nino, basically meaning that the bodies of water down there across the equatorial Pacific will continue to warm and probably a higher likelihood that we keep things fairly warm here or at least warmer than normal as we head into the winter months. Almost a given too that we're going to keep El Nino in place throughout the entire winter. And I do want to stress this. It does favor that we'll see the warmer and the drier conditions, but it does not guarantee it. So looking at the Climate Prediction Center's forecast here as we head throughout December, January, February, typical pattern and sort of signature when it comes to El Nino farther south across the country. Things are wetter than normal for us here across the Pacific Northwest. Well, at least the interior parts are looking to stay drier than normal. Us here across Western Washington should stay right around average. But when it comes to that strong El Nino, better chances of us staying warmer than normal here as we head into the upcoming season. And again, I do want to stress this, that it does favor, but it does not guarantee that we will see those types of weather in our forecast. Because at the end of the day, Mother Nature will always have the final say. El Nino can have a bigger impact than just the weather outside your window. Meteorologist Leah Pizzetti shares how it could hurt our snowpack and in turn impact our water supply and fish. It's a prediction that happens every year. El Nino or La Nina. What will the first few months of the new year bring? This year, it's El Nino. Overall, what you're looking at for this year, particularly in terms of snowpack, is the potential for less snowpack, especially at lower elevations because of the warmer temperatures. El Nino usually leads us to warm and typically dry winters, but notice the way lead meteorologist Rich Marriott starts this next sentence. Well, normally an El Nino means that 
Overall, we should have warmer than normal temperatures during the winter. This year, the setup is different. The ocean waters that drive our big picture weather are even warmer than normal, creating a situation we haven't seen before. But the, the real wild card in all of this is the fact that those uh, forecasts using El Nino and La Nina are based on statistics. And now we have the problem that the climate's changing. So the system is changing and we don't know if those same statistics are going to apply. Will we have the same correlations? In the meantime, many Washington agencies are bracing for this potentially dry spell. In September, Seattle Public Utilities asked 1.5 million customers to voluntarily cut back on water usage. The first time this ask was made since 2015. And right now our reservoirs are lower than we want them to be. So we are concerned about having sufficient water through the end of the year, both for people and for fish. And we want our customers to reduce their water use so we can stretch the water supply. This is due in part to the dry year so far, with reservoirs only getting about a quarter of the typical rain from May to September, but also because of this dry winter outlook, so people are being asked to lend a hand. And really, if everyone just does a little bit collectively, it does add up to make a big difference. SPU says multiple large storms are needed to replenish those reservoirs, but looking forward, there are no guarantees with this forecast. Only way we're going to find out is by moving forward and seeing what happens. Taking a closer look at snowpack, we crunched the numbers for average snow depth at Stevens Pass on March 15th over the last 13 years. And what we found is that El Nino doesn't necessarily guarantee a lack of snowpack. Take 2004 to 2005. That winter was a weak El Nino and we had the thinnest snowpack of the 30 winters, just 18% of normal on March 15th. That tracks with what we know about El Nino generally meaning shallower snowpacks. But during the three other weak El Nino years during those 30 winters, snowpack varied from 20% of normal to 101%. And specifically, what about a strong El Nino like NOAA is forecasting this year? We had two strong El Ninos during those three decades and both of them had snow packs above 80% of normal on March 15th. So don't sell your skis quite yet. Some of the biggest winter storms we've seen in the past and could see this winter come in the form of atmospheric rivers. King 5 senior meteorologist Rich Marriott walks us through how they're formed and how they could actually be beneficial. Atmospheric river may sound like something new, but it's really just another name for the Pineapple Express. This is what we used to call the drenching warm rains that flow from just to the north of Hawaii. It turns out that the Pineapple Express is just one type of atmospheric river. Researchers in the 1990s determined that these narrow bands of moisture over the oceans constantly transport huge amounts of water from the tropics to the mid-latitudes where we live. These plumes of water vapor are narrow, usually only several hundred miles wide, but thousands of miles long, resembling a river in the sky. And these rivers are low in the atmosphere, generally less than two miles in depth, far below where jetliners fly. Despite being narrow, they carry unbelievable amounts of water. The largest atmospheric rivers may carry the equivalent of two Amazon rivers, almost 10 trillion gallons of water per day. Most of this water vapor stays in the clouds until it collides with land, like our west coast. Since all this water is low in the atmosphere, it's forced up over the mountains, and in the process, much of that water is dropped on the west-facing slopes. The most destructive atmospheric rivers are those that stall over one area and persist for days. These are the ones that can dump feet of rainfall and cause massive flooding and widespread landslides. However, weaker atmospheric rivers are important to our water supply. 30 to 50% of West Coast rainfall comes from atmospheric rivers. Over the years, Washington has had some pretty intense winter storms. Last year, winter kicked off with a bang when freezing rain caused ice to blanket roads and sidewalks. Flights were canceled and troopers responded to hundreds of crashes. Then, a week later, the pendulum swing shifted. King tides caused flooding across western Washington. Olympia even set a record for the highest tide in history. Meteorologist Leah Pizzetti shares some of Seattle's other extreme weather records. From big snow years to wet winters, Seattle has had some pretty extreme weather records. The snowiest winter recorded at SeaTac was from 1968 to 1969. We got over five feet of snow. Normally, Seattle gets fewer than six inches a year. On average, February is Seattle's snowiest month. But of all the winters, 1950 may have been the most severe. That year set multiple snow and cold temperature records. 
Seattle's biggest snowfall day in a single day was January 13th, 1950. Our coldest high temperature was just 16 degrees on January 14th, and our coldest overnight temperature was zero degrees on January 31st. Overall, 1950 was Seattle's coldest winter too. On the other hand, Seattle's warmest winter was from 2014 to 2015. The following summer was Washington's worst wildfire season, more than 1 million acres burned. A couple months later, it swung the other way and Seattle had its wettest year on record. More than two feet of rain fell. That's nearly 10 inches above normal. Seattle's driest winter came in 1976 to 1977. About five inches fell from December to February. Over 113 years ago, the world learned that man is no match for the mountains. The deadliest avalanche in U.S. history happened right here in Western Washington. At the end of February in 1910, a blizzard hit the Stevens Pass area for nine straight days, creating a perfect storm of conditions for the disaster that followed. I took a trip to the pass where you can still see relics of that tragedy. At the turn of the century, Wellington was more than a rail stop. It was a town, complete with a hotel and a school. Its population made up almost entirely of Great Northern Railway workers. It was founded in 1893 at the western end of the now abandoned Cascade Tunnel. This is Wellington, or at least part of what's left of Wellington. It's one of those spots in western Washington that's hidden in plain sight. In fact, the entrance to Stevens Pass Ski Resort is right there. I can hear traffic along Highway 2. Wellington was once a vibrant stop along the line that connected Spokane and Puget Sound. Unfortunately for the people here in the town and aboard those two trains, they didn't realize that there was also another line and that they were on a collision course with an avalanche and a lot of snow. On February 23rd, 1910, a passenger and a mail train were stopped in Wellington because of heavy snowfall and avalanche danger. The passengers were trapped for six days waiting for the storm to pass. The snow was so intense, it fell up to a foot every hour at times. One day they say they got 11 feet of snow, 132 inches of snow in one day. On February 28th, temperatures warmed and the snow turned to rain, adding liquid weight to all that snow. And on March 1st, a slab of it broke loose from the mountain after being struck by lightning. Thousands of tons of it racing down a slope at 70 to 100 miles per hour. It took these two trains right off the tracks, tore them apart just to see the, the destruction to the metal you know, that was done from this is just, it's remarkable. People were trapped up to 40 feet under the snow and 96 of them died. Continued bad weather and the sheer size of the debris field stalled recovery efforts and the last body wasn't pulled out until July, 21 weeks later. Now, there is an upside. What followed has helped avoid similar disasters. In October, 1910, the railway began construction on massive concrete snow sheds over the tracks. It eventually dismantled the rail line away from the avalanche-prone mountain and onto lower elevation track that's still in use today. Thankfully, we haven't seen an avalanche disaster like in Wellington in decades. But as more people head to the backcountry to recreate, officials say it's still critically important to be avalanche aware. King 5's Eric Zuko has what you need to know if you're planning to ski, sled, or snowshoe out of bounds this winter. When snow falls in the mountains, you might be itching to get out there and play. But before you rent a pair of snowshoes, experts say there are a few things to keep in mind to recreate safely in avalanche terrain. Dallas Glass with the Northwest Avalanche Center says thousands of avalanches are naturally caused, whether that's from a big storm, rainfall on snow, or wind blowing snow around. Most of these go unnoticed. But when someone is hurt or killed, more than 90% of those avalanches are caused by that person or someone in their group. The sort of idea that I'm like walking around in the forest and an avalanche like falls down off the mountainside on me, it, it can happen, but that's not really the avalanches we're concerned about. There has been a massive increase in backcountry users over the last few years, but Glass says avalanche deaths have actually flatlined, which experts say is a good thing. In the last 30 years, Washington saw an average of about two and a half avalanche deaths per year. In the last five, it's dropped to an average of 1.2. My decisions matter. So a little bit of education and some information can help me make good decisions and stay on the right side of that statistic. If you're planning to get out into the backcountry this winter, NWAC urges people to be prepared.
So when I think about things that we can all do, we all can get the training. We always need to get the forecast and you need to make sure you have the right gear, especially that avalanche rescue gear, if you're gonna engage with avalanche training. Eric Zuko, King 5 News. Now down here at sea level, it can take Mother Nature getting everything just right to see even a few snowflakes. Meteorologist Adam Claibon explains the science behind this recipe for snowfall in the Puget Sound region. Snow in Seattle. It's a relationship that is enjoyed by some, yes. but can be dreaded by others. No. It actually takes a perfect cold weather recipe to see snow in Seattle. Now the reason is because of this large body of water we live by. In the winter, Puget Sound and the Pacific Ocean sit in the mid to upper 40s. It makes it really difficult for places nearby to reach freezing with temperatures that mild. So in order for snow to form, we look for help from the Fraser River outflow. Interior British Columbia experiences sub-freezing temperatures due to the two large mountain ranges helping separate interior BC from coastal BC. As high pressure builds over British Columbia and low pressure builds over Puget Sound, we get a vacuum effect that can pull winds at up to 80 miles per hour out of the Fraser River Gap and whip it into places near Bellingham, the San Juans, and even down in Seattle. When this cold air moves in our neighborhoods, snow is more likely to fall in our backyards. In Seattle, snowplow routes cover over 1,000 miles of roadways. Priority areas include roads to hospitals, schools, emergency services, and shelters. If you want to see the snowplow routes in your neighborhood, text the word PLOW to 206-448-4545 and we'll send you a link. A cold weather is settling in all across the country and we're all doing our best to stay warm, but are your do-it-yourself tricks really getting the job done? Brandon Lewis from our Verify team takes a look at how to stay warm without breaking the bank. Frigid winter temperatures are here and with record high energy prices, you might think twice before cranking up the heat. So we looked into some common questions about whether things people do to stay warm are really a hot idea. First up, does turning your thermostat way up heat your home faster? Our sources are the U.S. Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, Black Hills Energy, and HVAC maker Glenn Dimplex. Furnaces have just two settings, on and off. They rely on a thermostat to know how long to stay on. Cranking the temperature up from 60 to 70 will only make your furnace run longer, but it won't heat your home any faster because it only has one setting, on, whether it's trying to increase the temperature one degree or 10 degrees. So no, turning the thermostat way up won't heat your home any faster. Next up, can window treatments help save you money? The Energy Department estimates in an average home, one third of heat is lost through the windows. You can prevent some of that from happening by keeping the drapes or shades closed at night because they act as an extra layer of insulation between your home and the windows. This helps keep up to 10% more heat inside your home, which can lower your energy bill. So yes, window treatments can help save you money. Finally, ceiling fans are a great way to stay cool, but can they also help keep your home warm? In the summer, you should set your fans to rotate counterclockwise to blow air down. This helps sweat evaporate and makes you feel cooler. In the winter, the energy department recommends reversing your fan so it spins clockwise and then using the lowest setting. This pulls up the cool air and displaces warm air that's near the ceiling. So yes, ceiling fans can help keep your home warm. Now before a cold spell, it's important to take proper precautions to keep your pipes from freezing. Experts recommend draining and disconnecting your garden hose, insulating any pipes in unheated areas, and draining all water from outside spigots. If your pipes do burst, turn off the water main and call a plumber immediately. Just because it's winter doesn't mean you have to stop gardening. Seattle's gardening expert Cisco Morris has some must-do garden chores for when it's cold and wet outside. Winter's creeping in, and I'm going to show you the three things you need to do to get your garden through the winter time. So, number one, this is the hardest one, you got to weed. Now, you may think you could just throw mulch over weeds like this guy right here. He'll be back to haunt you in the spring, so it's kind of a pain. Okay, this is hard work now. But wait till you see how much better your garden looks in spring. 
So your next winter chore is to get rid of all this stuff that looks terrible. You're doing your neighbor a nice favor when you do this. So dahlias really look bad when they die bad. So you just gotta cut these off right at the base. I'll bet you think that you gotta dig this out to keep that dahlia alive. But I'm gonna show you a trick I use every year and I almost never lose a dahlia. So I do cover them with these evergreen fern fronds and these are everywhere. And don't forget to put a rock on top so they don't blow away. These are great insulators, but more important they repel the water, the rain that comes down, and so the tubers don't rot in the ground. Next is one of the most important things you could do. You want to put mulch down on the soil of the garden. Now, my favorite mulch is wood chips from the arborist. Why do I like these? Because they don't pack down like bark does, which doesn't allow air and moisture to get to the roots of the plant. They give you great weed control, and it breaks down into the best topsoil you've ever seen. Just spread it out. Now, if I have wide spots that are open, I'll put it six inches deep to keep the weeds from growing, but otherwise I put it about two inches deep. One last tip. If you're a vegetable gardener, don't forget to harvest your vegetables. <laughs> This winter, you can stay up to date with King 5's First Alert team. We'll bring you the most accurate and updated forecast to help keep you and your family safe. And remember, thriving through a Pacific Northwestern winter is very much like forecasting it. All you gotta do is keep looking up. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.